Hey everyone, I'm Abby Sharp. Welcome to another edition of Fertility Files. Now today's video is a request from all of you guys. We're gonna be going over some of the most common pregnancy diet myths and I'm gonna be attacking them with science. Yay, science! All right, now before we get started, of course, just my general disclaimer that the information that you're about to see is for educational and entertainment purposes only, and you should always speak to a healthcare professional about your unique case. Okay, let's get into this. Myth number one, you should not eat peanuts while pregnant because it will increase the risk of allergies in the baby. So this is really old school and actually really dangerous misinformation. The good news to my fellow pregnant mamas-to-be is that you're eating the peanut butter out of the jar with a spoon may actually be good for your babe. New research published in 2014 found that eating more peanuts and tree nuts during pregnancy was linked to a lower risk of peanut and tree nut allergies in their baby. This is in direct opposition to older, lower quality research that found no impact or even a higher risk of allergies in peanut loving mamas. These findings are much more aligned with the research and recommendations on early introduction of peanut products for infants, where we now know it's actually much better to introduce peanuts pretty much as soon as babes start solids around the six month mark. But more on that later. Myth number two, you need to eat for two. Now, it turns out the old adage, eating for two, isn't necessarily true. At least it's not very accurate. Unless your usual intake is grossly under where it should be, there's no need to be consuming twice of what you're eating right now. If that were true, that would mean eating like 4,000 calories instead of 2,000 calories, which is just not necessary to support the health and growth of your baby. I prefer to think instead about listening to my body, and some people like to say, let's try to eat twice as healthy rather than twice as much. You guys know me, I don't like numbers, but in case you're wondering what the official recommendations are, in the first trimester, you really don't necessarily need to eat much more at all on average. By the second trimester, you're looking at an additional 350 calories or so, and by the third trimester, that may be bumped up to maybe 500 calories or so. But FYI, that is like literally a muffin, <laughs> not a double portion of burgers, shakes, and fries, which fine, of course. I mean, if you're hungry, go for it. But I wouldn't make a point to try to eat a ton extra just because you're expecting. If you're eating intuitively, you probably won't need to even think about these numbers at all, and you might just need an extra snack or two throughout the day. Your appetite is actually an amazing guide for your needs if you just try to tune in. Myth number three, drinking coffee during pregnancy causes miscarriages. Although the statement is pretty extreme, there is some minor truth to it. Now, excessive amounts of caffeine is ultimately not great for you or for your baby. A meta-analysis of case-controlled and cohort studies suggested that consuming too much caffeine could increase the risk of low birth weight infants, stillbirth, and miscarriages. So if you're typically a heavy coffee, strong tea, or caffeinated soda drinker, it's best to limit your caffeine intake to less than 200 to 300 milligrams a day, which would be no more than like two cups of coffee or maybe four cups of tea. And that is true whether or not you're thinking of becoming pregnant or you are already pregnant. The risk here is really due to the fact that caffeine passes through the placenta to the fetus, influencing its development. So personally, you guys know I went decaf, and the reason for that was because A, I was on prednisone while trying to get pregnant, and caffeine is contraindicated on that drug. B, for my sleep, since caffeine stays in your system for up to 12 hours, and C, because personally I had so much on the line here with the IVF and things like that, that it just wasn't worth the risk. So for me, less was just safer. On that note, myth number four, herbal tea is a better option than coffee because it's caffeine free and all natural. Okay, so for this, I would say, don't make assumptions that something that is all natural is necessarily better. The reality is there just isn't a whole lot of research on whether or not herbal teas are beneficial or harmful during your pregnancy. Health Canada, however, does outline a list of herbal teas that are considered safe and those that should maybe be avoided. So specifically, things like chamomile, teas with aloe, coltsfoot, juniper berries, penny royale, buckthorn bark, comfrey, 
Labrador tea, sassafras, duck roots, lobelia, and senna leaves are the ones to definitely avoid, while citrus peel, ginger, lemon balm, orange peel, and rosehip tea are generally considered safe in moderation, which would be about two to three cups per day. There is limited research that looks at herbal medicines and remedies, but not on herbal teas specifically. So when in doubt, always consult a health professional or just make sure to stick to a small portion. Now, myth number five, you need to drink two cups of milk a day while pregnant. So this really comes from the idea that women need about a thousand milligrams of calcium per day while pregnant, and that you can get that in about two cups of milk per day. I think we've made it pretty clear, but milk is not the only way to get your calcium needs. So you can easily choose another fortified non-dairy beverage or include lots of things like legumes, nuts, seeds, and dark green veggies. Or, you know, you can always just take a supplement if nothing is sounding good right now, which I get because morning sickness. Myth number six, you shouldn't eat fish because of the mercury content and it may harm your baby. Okay, so this myth won't necessarily apply to my vegan followers, but I will say that the benefits of eating fish are considered much greater than any potential risks of eating it while pregnant. Fish is rich in essential nutrients, including protein, DHA, EPA, omega-3s, vitamin D, choline, and minerals such as iodine, iron, zinc, copper, and selenium all of which are advantageous for women planning to become pregnant and those who are already pregnant. What you do have to be cautious of are the types, amounts, and preparation of fish. So specifically, you'll want to avoid fish that are rich in methylmercury. This neurotoxin is able to cross the placenta and cause irreversible damage to the central nervous system, particularly to the baby's sensitive developing brain while in utero. The major fish to avoid include large ocean predator fish. So fresh or frozen tuna, swordfish, shark, king mackerel, sea bass, mahi-mahi, grouper, amberjack, escalar, aka butterfish, marlin, tilefish, bluefin, yellowfin, pickerel, and orange roughy. If one of these are one of your favorites, the most you'll want to consume during pregnancy is about 150 grams per month. Now, canned white albacore tuna is totally okay in moderation with about 300 grams or 10 ounces per week or about two 170 gram cans considered to be safe. It's also recommended for food safety purposes that you avoid any raw fish, even if it is from a really good sushi place. You just really never know and foodborne illness can be really serious for you and your growing babe. So in terms of what is safe, ideally you want to aim for at least two servings or five ounces of fish per week, at least one of which should be one of the really omega-3 rich fatty fish. So examples of safe fish include salmon, trout, arctic char, Atlantic mackerel, herring, sardines, bassa, tilapia, sole, flounder, halibut, haddock, pollock, anchovies, cod, and canned light tuna. Shrimp, scallops, clams, and mussels are also safe as well. All right, next myth is you should stop exercising to protect your baby. This statement was once associated with an increase in infertility, miscarriage, and preterm delivery, but after a lot of research, it's actually recommended for expectant mothers to engage in at least 30 minutes of moderate activity three times per week. Regular physical activity can help improve your mood and promote better sleep while reducing your risk for some diseases. During the prenatal period specifically, physical activity may help reduce the risk of some cardiovascular diseases and gestational diabetes, plus it is associated with improving your ability to cope with labor and delivery and assisting in your recovery. Having said that, always, always, always speak to your doctor about intensity. Depending on your unique case, and if you have a history of any complications like a subchorionic hematoma, you may be recommended to keep your activity to things like walking or really light weights rather than doing anything intense. You also do not want to start a new intense program while pregnant if you weren't doing it before pregnancy. Now is not the time to be looking to get a six pack FYI. So just move in a way that feels good to you and make sure that you're hydrated and well nourished before and after as well. Next myth, you can't be vegan and have a healthy pregnancy. 
So some people may disagree with me, but I see zero reason why anyone would need to eat animal products to maintain a healthy pregnancy, assuming they're otherwise eating a relatively balanced diet and taking their supplements. In fact, one study found that high intakes of red and processed meats potentially increase the risk of gestational diabetes. Obviously, there are a lot of lean alternatives that would not carry the same risks, but I'm just making the point that there's no perfect pregnancy food or diet. It's really all about quality. Yes, meat can help provide the B12 and heme iron that mothers-to-be have higher needs for, but a well-planned vegetarian or vegan diet can easily meet your requirements for protein, calcium, iron, and essential fatty acids. Just keep in mind that getting enough vitamin B12 may require some extra attention. So if you are a vegetarian or vegan, pregnant or not, remember to incorporate B12 fortified foods or supplements and avoid consuming them with large amounts of vitamin C, which can reduce their absorption. Next myth, cooling foods like papaya and pineapple can cause miscarriage. At the moment, there's not a whole lot of research out there that's been done that looks at any particular food item having a direct impact on miscarriage risk. Here's the truth. Research in rats and in petri dish subjects have seen that large amounts of a compound in pineapple called bromelain has been linked to uterine contractions, which may theoretically cause preterm labor. But even if this was the case in humans, you would have to eat a lot of pineapple to make that impact. Ditto for papaya. I've only seen research on rats when it comes to unripe papaya and there being an increased risk of early labor. But again, this research is on rats and in really big amounts and not even on ripe papaya. Personally, I would not freak out either way if you ate any no-no foods during pregnancy since it's really very much more about dietary patterns than any particular food. Research has found that a diet low in vegetables and fruit may increase the risk of miscarriage. So eat your pineapple or your papaya if you like it, and just focus on getting a variety of fruit in your diet to switch it up. I'm gonna leave a link below with all of the available evidence I could find on different kinds of foods that may or may not be safe in pregnancy. So that way you can make the most evidence-based decisions for yourself. Next myth, prenatal vitamins are only for women with vitamin deficiencies. Prenatal vitamins are not just for women with vitamin deficiencies or even just for pregnant women. In fact, Health Canada recommends that women of childbearing age take these multivitamins to ensure a healthy pregnancy. Because hey, sometimes mistakes happen and you want to be prepared. There is a lot of research available that's linked to adequate folic acid supplementation and a decrease in the risk of neural tube defects. So it is recommended that women of childbearing age take folic acid supplements in addition to having a diet rich in folate. And that is true before conception and of course during pregnancy. A lot of moms also opt to continue the prenatal vitamin after pregnancy to just help with rebuilding their nutrient stores, especially if you're breastfeeding and your nutrient stores are still very high. However, it's worth noting that not all multivitamins are the same. I definitely recommend choosing methylated folate instead of folic acid. Most supplements will have folic acid because it's more stable, but your body then has to convert it to active methylfolate, and up to 60% of women have a gene variant that hinders this conversion. This gene is also linked to PCOS and miscarriage. So just to be safe, I would always choose a supplement with methylated folate if you have that option. Next myth, eating too much sugar will cause gestational diabetes. Now, when we think about diabetes, sugar is usually the first thing that pops into our mind. However, with the emergence of research over the years, we now know that the cause of diabetes is really not that simple. The risk factors for gestational diabetes include things like high maternal age, weight, family history, having multiple births, and a previous birth of a large baby. During pregnancy, even healthy women tend to be more insulin resistant in general to promote additional glucose getting to the fetus, especially women who are over the age of 35. Unfortunately, this puts pregnant women at a higher risk for gestational diabetes, not the act of eating sugar. But what about the indirect role of sugar in weight gain and gestational diabetes? 
Well, we know that eating too much of anything can cause weight gain, and research has linked excessive weight gain to higher risk of gestational diabetes. That fact, however, is not telling the whole story. It's often the case that excessive weight gain during pregnancy may be the result of restrictive dieting prior to pregnancy. So asking a mama-to-be to go on a restrictive diet is potentially putting them at risk of continuing on this dangerous diet roller coaster. The best thing that we can do is not diet or restrict. While sugar per se is not necessarily the culprit, having a healthy diet in general definitely may help. One study found that a Mediterranean or DASH style diet helped reduce the risk of gestational diabetes, suggesting that a diet rich in fiber rich fruits, vegetables and whole grains and lower in red and processed meat may help lower the risk. So try to focus on what you're including in your diet rather than what you're cutting out. Well friends, I hope that this was helpful and enlightening, not just for my pregnant mamas, but really for all of you who know someone who's pregnant or may one day want to be pregnant or support a partner through a healthy pregnancy. If you have any other pregnancy, IVF or infertility questions that you want me to cover in my fertility files, definitely leave me a comment below. And as always, do not forget to like, comment, share, subscribe, and I will see you next time on Abby's Kitchen. Bye.